Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure of welcoming this fantastic panel. Uh, I would wait and then uh, start by uh, introducing each of you. Uh, you'll do that by yourself, but basically just notifying that you know we have two males and two females, so it's a very strong set of diversity here. So uh, I'm really happy about that. Uh, this session about, is about creating urban impact. Uh, myself, I've created a venture capital fund focused on investing into technologies into the urban space. But I really wanted to create a panel today and be moderator of something where we have the current industry, we have someone who's looking into urban tech on an early stage, and then one who's actually also been in the industry, but is also moving into more the tech angle and have been doing that for many years. So I'll start off by you introducing yourself, Lona, and then we get back to the topic. Okay. Which hat would you like me to wear? The one you prefer. <laughs> sure. I'm here as uh, Director for Sustainable Buildings in uh, the Velux Group. I'm an architect uh, by profession, and then I have uh, uh, transformed uh, during that course. I've been in Velux for several years, but I've specialized in sustainability 12 years ago and took a master's degree in sustainability in China and Denmark. And uh, then maybe going forward a bit, but I think sustainability has turned into innovation and tech, so it's a little bit the same, but in disguise. Great, thank you. Great start. Um, great to see you, Lona. Um, Michael Ambjorn, I'm the Managing Director of Urban Tech and Accelerator, based in Copenhagen, uh, which wouldn't be possible without actually uh, Velux, uh, VKR and Velux, and of course uh, also EV, Covi, and very importantly, two philanthropists, Industries Fund and Real Dania, uh, who are coming together to basically uh, change how we look at, at urban tech very practically, one pilot at a time. Um, so. All of that is ultimately powered by rainmaking, where I also spend some time. And uh, the reason for really being interested in this topic, apart from the sustainability angle, because in case you're in doubt, climate change is real, uh, is the fact that I've worked with uh, urban tech startups in the past myself as well. My name is Natasha Fried Saxper. I'm the CEO of the Danish ICT Industry Association. I've been playing around with tech for more than 25 years. And as Christian mentioned, I've also been looking into impact and sustainability. And today, actually, I think it's hard to separate the two areas because, uh, yes, we need to work on the climate, but the added benefit is actually also good for business. So I'm still working on that agenda. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. So if we start to focus on not the green side or the technology side or the investment side, but starting from the top and saying urban, that area, if we focus in on that, what are the biggest problems that you see we have in the urban space? Well, you have buildings. The CO2 emission is 39% uh, of the world emissions, so that's an obvious problem. You have of, uh, pollution in the cities. 30% is caused from cars uh, looking around for, for available parking areas. So we have so many obvious problems, but also possible solutions. I think it's not so much the technologies that's a barrier. It's more changing the systemic foundation on which we have built our societies. The way we think, the way we act, the way we incentivize and measure outcome. So it's, as I say, it's not technology. It's, it's more uh, the systemic development we need. I think that's right, and I, I would like to add to it a couple of more data points, right? So we, you all know Manhattan, it's a tightly controlled space, mainly going up into the sky. We'll be basically adding one more Manhattan uh, at the same size to the world every month, right? And we're going to do that for the next 50 years in order to keep up with the population growth that is projected, right? So the other thing to bear in mind, uh, which is... Um, around the fact that we actually spend 90% of our time indoors. So cities we often think about as being basically us running around on a bike or whatever else, but there's also a strong indoor element, uh, which then builds into air quality and so on, which I'm sure Luna will talk more about. The other key thing is that cities are for a long time, right? Some of them have been around for hundreds of years, as this one we are standing in today, in some cases, thousands of years. And I think it was last year we passed the point where we've added more man-made material or human-made materials to the world than the total mass of organic living beings. So more man-made, human-made materials than organic living beings, right? Just to put it in your mind. If that doesn't mess with your mind, uh, I don't know what will. And bear in mind that a lot of that is concrete and highways and railways and so on, basically around cities. At the same time, it is also potentially the one chance we have to basically 
exits the climate crisis in some ways because we need the efficiencies of cities, but we need to make sure that they are also livable whilst we solve that. Well, I, I definitely subscribe and agree to what you have uh, already said. Um, Cities is such a huge representative, 70% of the global uh, CO2 emissions. Buildings as such represent uh, nearly 40% of the CO2 emissions. And 12% is materials, which is incredibly important, but 28% of that is actually the run, the operations of the buildings. And the problem, that is a problem in itself, but it also says something about how big the opportunity is to resolve the climate crisis or, or reach our climate goals. Uh, through doing something clever about uh, buildings. But the biggest problem I see, which was your question, is that we lack uh, a language. Mm -hmm. we, we lack um, a sufficient professional language for what it is about. We have a tendency to be, sorry, a bit ignorant about buildings and judging it by either personal aesthetics or a postal code or an energy label. And that doesn't suffice for what it is we want to uh, resolve. But I think that's really interesting to take up because fundamentally when you look at it, the last 10, 15 years, our habits have changed. So we have started to use consumer tech like when we order a pizza, when we book a taxi, these sorts of things. And, and some of these things have you know, improved life in the urban area. But maybe start with you, Natasha. You know, you've worked in technology for the last 15, 20 years. Why have we not you know, come up with technologies that basically solve some of these more urgent these more important problems that we're talking about now, why have they focused on consumer tech, you know, adding social media communication, these sorts of things? Mm. Well, there, I have two answers to that. One, many of the problems we see today is created earlier in the value chain before it reaches the consumer. So you have food laws. 30% of all food gets wasted. 75% of that waste happens in the supply chain. So from the farmer till the supermarket. But many of the apps and the solutions we see today are on the consumer side because it's easier. And one company can do something about one problem. But if we really want to create impact, we need to focus on what's going wrong in the 75% or in the big impact on the, on the supply chains. The challenge to that, and that's the second answer to your question, is that that's cross-sectoral. It's, it's, you need several stakeholders to sit together in a room saying, if we want to solve this, what do we need to do so everyone wins? Because you have so many people out there making money on stuff not being technological or digitized or documented. So we need to create a win-win for every entity or maybe figure out how can we go around it because there are so many middlemen out there making money on stuff not being efficient. But we also just have an old way of looking at problems. So we focus on the working processes of today instead of what, we, what problem do we need to solve. So I hope we become more mission-oriented and less idea-focused in the future. So, so maybe over to you, Lone, because I would assume, you know, even though, you know, I know Velux very well uh, from different, you know, backgrounds, I guess the title that you have, you know, Director for Sustainable Buildings was not there 10 years ago. And, you know, I, but I think it's an important notion because how do you see kind of, you know, you as one of the industry players, how are you leaning in on this and why is that first coming now? Why was that not, you know, something that was on the agenda 10 years ago? I think it was on the agenda. Actually, I know it was because I was offered my first new position. I was a classic manager, and then I was offered a new position as strategic project manager for a sustainable project. And when I asked what it was, they said, we don't know, you're the first one. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's uh, paving uh, a way. But at that time, we were in Denmark looking at sustainable buildings as a whole in the industry. And we were looking towards Germany, Austria, uh, Switzerland, uh, the triangle yep. of uh, those three countries because they had been working on this since the 80s because of anti-nuclear movement. They didn't want nuclear in their houses, so they developed a scheme for how to make an, an, an energy efficient uh, building that was like an island that didn't need that nuclear coming in. Yeah. Then it turned to Putin and gas, but it was the same th story. They didn't want it into their buildings. And that actually all meant that they were quite ahead of us. But I think we are at level, but maybe also leading, not least to, to initiatives like the one uh, Michael is uh, leading, because what is happening with the tech um, dimension of buildings is that it's trying to close this disconnect that there is between uh, buildings and the users, or the use of the buildings and, and the construction of it. It's like 
there's a complete cut. Uh, you don't have uh, contact to the ones who have uh, designed or constructed your building, and they don't know how it works. And that's where tech can resolve it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have property tech. Yes. I think they're having their conference uh, today, even, exactly. as well. And, and uh, this whole way of seeing what's going on in buildings is going to be the disruption we've been waiting for. Yeah. But that's very interesting because you talk about value change. You're part of the player here. So maybe over to you, Michael. Are you optimistic? that we would say, see the same development like we saw in the automotive industry in the 80s where the value chain went like this, where you have the user and you have the uh, manufacturer, what you would call it, the owner, and then we are closer. Do you see startups out there who are actually trying to break the constraint and putting the value chain closer to each other, the actors, the stakeholders? Uh, yes and no, right? So uh, to build a little bit of both uh, what Natasha said and what uh, Luna said, uh, first of all, uh, we were solving a lot of fake problems, right? So basically, teenage boys, Silicon Valley, can't be bothered to cook, don't know how to drive or unable to, unable to drive. So here comes Uber, here comes Just Eat, here comes all these other uh, things to solve basically fake problems for teenage boys, right? The problems we're talking about are real problems that affect a real world that we live in and that we're going to have for 100 years plus in one way or another, right? Even if we figured out how to do gigacorns and whatever else, which I'm sure we'll come back to, it's, it's going to be with us for a long time. And to really go back to it, it it's not entirely new. Like Gaia theory isn't, didn't come around yesterday, right? Uh, we, we've been know, we known about climate change. We've known about these sustainability challenges for a very, very long time. But we just can't help ourselves as humanity because we are a little bit lazy. We want to do the things to scale fast, that make a big return. And are exciting to read about in the newspaper and so on, right? Zoom, there goes a, a scooter past us. Woohoo, right? But in reality, um, what we need are a different type of startup, right, that can work with very, very large established organizations because they're the only ones that actually really have the existing reach, right? We can't wait for a startup to grow into the size of GE or indeed VLUX or indeed any other number of companies. We need to smash these into the value chain and actually rewire the value chain to, to a large extent, right? And part of, of the challenge that you and I found yesterday when we were in a different setting at the Digital Hub Denmark, which is looking at ecosystems and ecospheres and so on, is that even there, we're often still thinking in silos, in verticals, right? And we do need that, but we also need the cross-pollination in between it. And I think if we've seen since, I'd say, since the end of the Second World War, where we've really seen specialization grow in universities, PhDs, all this kind of stuff, where people have narrowed in more and more, what we're going to see now in the next 10, 20 years is people smashing bear out again. All right. So the interesting question is obviously for the audience here, has this changed after COVID-19? And I would assume all of you would say, yes, it has. So obviously you're okay to disagree if you, uh, if you, if you don't agree, but I think maybe just take a round on how do you see it has changed and what will be the consequences now on creating urban impact? Well, I think it's, we still need to see what's the behavior going to be after uh, COVID because there's a lot of cars in the street already. So will we be able to create a, a, a change that's going to stay for a longer time? And I think we, we have that benefit that it's really hard to get good people in our companies. And we can't really compete much more in salary or in other uh, perks. So I think one thing, the flexibility of where you live and that you use the time you have in your life, not for sitting in traffic, but for other more meaningful purposes, I think that's going to be a, a, a competition area for companies who want to attract, attract the best employees. But that demands that we create that change of mindset that it's okay, we're not here, yeah. all physical. So that's one area. And I also think um, another uh, breaking point is, of course, that when we meet physically, it's still biology, so all the great uh, endorphins, dopamine, all the stuff we, we get into our bodies will not get into our bodies when we see each other on Zoom. So we still need to find that hybrid model where we get the energy from other people but use the technology where it makes sense. So yeah. it's not never going to be a virtual world alone because then we're going to die unhappy and lonely. So it's going to find that hybrid. But version. I guess that's an interesting discussion because fundamentally what you would like to have is you want to change habits. That's fundamentally what we're talking about here. Like when we, before we order the pizza in one way, or a taxi, now we're going to, you know, use the city and the urban area in another way. So why not just force that through, you know, and build companies that basically this is how it is now. And then the generations of our grandchildren and so on, they will live in a world where 
obviously DNA wise, you know, we have for thousands of years, you know, millions of years fundamentally been used to, you know, connecting, mm. being physical and so on and, and getting that biological, you can say, impact. But um, the question is, will they see it in the same way? Because they will get born into a different reality. Well, evolution is slow, and that's why our thumbs are not text-friendly yet. So it's going to take a, more than just a coronavirus period to change behavior. But in order to change behavior, you need to change the norms. And that's going to be the hard part. So is it okay that you don't show up physically? Uh, and how do we collaborate? Because I think we've seen a range of new technology evolving, but it's more been the connecting technologies, not so much the collaboration tools, the creative tools. So we need to reach another level on our technological methods and, and tools in order to be able to do stuff as well virtually as physically in order to create that change uh, for, for good. Thank you. <laughs> to build on that, um, I think if we think back, all of us briefly close our eyes and think back to when we first realized that Corona was going to be something that was going to impact all of us. And then think about the meetings you had around that time. Uh, I'm placing myself in a room with basically the CEOs in our steering group, right? And they're basically going like, all right, then what, right? And to, to think about the fact that we could change things so quickly because we had to. Right? So we overcame a massive inertia to an extent in all of us of basically rethinking things. Right? And I remember one of the CEOs going like, oh, I didn't realize that you could ship laptops to all your employees in basically a week if you really had to. Turns out you can. Might have been a little bit more expensive than usual, but you could. Right? You've probably seen there's a cartoon that's going around with you know, who changed the organization. Was it the CIO, was it the CEO, or was it just COVID-19, right? And to a large extent, it was COVID-19 uh, because it basically forced change. Natasha is right to say how much of it will stay with us. That is a really open question. I think that we'll go back, but we won't go completely back. And I'm basing that on the simple fact that I, I had a working lunch with one of our startups who flew in this morning with a corona test, only to go and get another corona test, basically so that he could pitch to a panel um, and he knew that turning up in person was going to be the thing that's going to make the difference. So I think we will see a, a, a shift back, but not a complete shift back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how it, how it develops. Um, <clears throat> I, um, we are, as a business, uh, very much uh, dealing with residential, uh, the residential industry. And well, everybody has homes, all of you have homes. Um, and definitely we can see that the relationship with our homes has changed significantly. Who knew that you could fit a fitness room, a restaurant, uh, a school, uh, uh, workout and, and all of that into uh, the four walls you have, or rather you couldn't. So that's why a lot of people are taking uh, uh, fast decisions and uh, doing a drastic home move. IKEA does a yearly report. Um, about home habits and the one they have done for the past year, they have labeled the big home reboot because it seems that uh, they have asked, I think, 38,000 people about their relationship with their home and that's just, it, it stands out. Sustainability, uh, comfort, um, clean air is something that we are very preoccupied with and we've had it in the urban tech for, uh, for the past two years and we'll have this year as well. And there, I think we can see a very distinct development because the first year it was, oh, you can measure air quality. Oh, how interesting, a sensor, a thing that can you know, measure something. Uh, but then what can you do with that? Yeah, next round, what can you do with the data? And then what can you act on the data? So you have to make it relatable and make it actionable. And that we can see within the three years that urban tech has existed, we can see that development. And coming back to your question with COVID, this weekend uh, there was an article in The Economist describing fresh air in buildings. It's yeah. time to freshen out the air in buildings. And that has resonated in, obviously, the business world. We have worked with it professionally all along and, and a lot of researchers, but it is a thing out there. The German government says, please open the windows to change the air every so and so often. And that is just a notion that is coming back and that's not technology. It's an understanding, it's the normative that changes. And I don't think that's going away. I think it's here to stay. Great, thank you very much. So we mapped out there's huge problems to be solved. They can actually have an impact. 
we've heard, you know, technology can be a part of solution. There are solutions out there. Um, there are starting to be investments into it, but why have we not invested more into this if we know right now after COVID-19, this is the opportunity, you know, why have we not, you know, invested in the past and what do you think we should invest more in the future? Uh, I'll be Mike? provocative and yeah, put it yeah. back to you, right? You, you're, you're an investor, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you've obviously had a conversion, but um, I think there's still a lot of room for conversion. And why is the room for conversion there? Well, it's, it's very, very simple. Ultimately, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, when it comes to investment, eventually you end up with a form of spreadsheet, right? And in that spreadsheet, when you add everything up, at the very, very end, at the very bottom of the spreadsheet, there is a number. And it's either, depending on your spreadsheet language, red or black. And for a long time, there's been, if nothing else, a perception that ah, the sustainability bit, you know, it'll end up with a red number at the bottom. Or the horizon is too long. I want my money back next quarter or next year or within 10 years rather than maybe 50 years, right? Don't forget, when we lay down water pipes, we plan them for 100 years hence, right? So the return on investment is much longer. But for a lot of basic modern business, the, it's, it's much more aggressive than that. Why is literally trillions of dollars and euros and maybe even bizarrely Bitcoin shifting towards basically sustainable investment right now? That's because in the large institutional investment houses, it's not because they've suddenly walked into a forest and found a tree and started hugging it and went like, this feels good, man. It's because at the very, 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 very big spreadsheet, the color of the number has changed. And they realize that the pension funds that they're looking after. So in Denmark, for example, there are 4,000 billion kroner in pension funds, right? And they realize that they need to pay those back out to the pensioners. And that might be some of you or some of us eventually. There's a very long time range. And in order to make that work, they need a black number at the bottom. And if society breaks in the meantime, it'll be a red number. Natasha? Well, back to one of my first points is that we see convergence of industries and we need to collaborate across industries in order to build the new world. And as humans, we create the future from our past, not from our future yet, because you don't have the business case to say that points short. But if you look at, at the power to x as an example, mm -hmm. you have the companies that has CO2 emission, and then you have the conversion, but then you need to have someone who can use it. Mm -hmm. So who are going to take responsibility for the facilitation of changing something from one industry, having the technology in the middle, and converting into another industry? And I think we don't really have that facilitation yet. Who will take responsibility? The startup can't do it. The old industry doesn't really understand it, maybe. And the other old industry might not even know it's possible. So you have venture somewhere in the middle of that saying, okay, we, we will invest in the future. We see a possibility here, but we need to change the mindset and the perception of profit, of value and of outcome, but also the time range. Yeah. And we live in a short-term world. So the short-termism are actually also killing that courage and vision we need in order to create these more long-term investments. And as we know, impact, sustainable investments, it will pay a return, but it might not be three to five years, it might be five to seven years. Mm. Back to we need a longer term, and many of the structures we have today are short term, democracy, capitalism, etc. The way we give incentives to managers and, and, the, and the CEOs. So it's back to the people business and not so much the tech business. Yeah, thanks. Lona, any comments from you? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, well, investment is uh, impact or impact investment, what would that be? What is the impact actually? Is it a number in a spreadsheet um, or, or what is it? I mean, buildings are gold mines uh, of uh, data, uh, but also as a gold mine, as a shortcut to our health and the livability and how well we function and the quality of the experience uh, with it, but actually also to reaching our climate goals. We only have one planet and we're spending it here in Denmark four and a half uh, times uh, a year reaching World Overshoot Day on, what is it, 28th of March. Mm -hmm. So it's obvious that we need to do something. And I think before we change the currency with which we measure it, we will not be able to assess what it's actually investment. 
Back if to the language you mentioned. It's the language, and then you need to have the, the currency uh, to follow it. And this is a personal viewpoint, um, because and I also know it's a bit controversial, talking absolute sustainability, but somehow there is one planet, and it is absolute. So why can we not talk about CO2 equivalents in kilo per square meter per year per person? Yes. Why do we always look at it per, per infinite or relative? I mean, should people live in one person in a 300 square meter house, or how do we how do we account for all that? And and we need to start uh, uh, accounting and assessing for it to be able to respect it, so that it becomes a currency that will become real impact investment. I can I can uh, then you know add to this, uh, even though I'm the moderator, but in our investment platform, we have come up with a new term called a gigacorn, which is fundamentally a company that can reduce one gigaton of CO2 which we know we have 51 of annually being emitted. We need to find 18 to 32 to reach the Paris Agreement within 10 years, while also being commercial viable. That's the two criteria. So we want to replace you know, a unicorn with finding gigacorns. And I think that is also back to we believe in the same thing that we need to change the taxonomy. We need to change the perception of how we look at this. And then I think actually also, Natasha, very, very interesting to, um, to your point here, we... Um, we, we are in a situation where value chains need to be disrupted and we need to see new value chains. And, and I think you know, that's going to transform and then actually provide that we get black numbers. I believe that this category, the urban category, is as big as it's going to create trillionaires, mm. but we will first see that in like 100 years because it's going to take a long time. And then to your time horizon perspective, there's no doubt about that we need to find exponential technologies. We have 10 years, we have a decade, otherwise we need to potentially leave the planet, you know, in 50 years. So, um, wait, very wait, wait, if I may comment that, I, yeah. where I'm a little bit worried is that if we think startups or emerging tech is going to save us because we don't have the time. It's 2.30, it's, it's a nine years, mm -hmm. eight and a half years. We need the asset owners to tell the technology makers, the entrepreneurs out there, what problem do we need to solve? Because if you have one million ideas and they don't solve the problem, we're going to waste a lot of years and a lot of money. So that's back to why we need to focus on mission instead of ideas. Ideas are cheap, scaling is hard. F fundamentally agree. And we found, so we invested in a technology company where we were lucky within concrete technology called Carbon Cure. They just won the Carbon X Prize to put a concrete manufacturer, a contractor, and a asset owner and then put them together and have the same language as you said, Luna. And then we fundamentally were able to get that new technology out. And that's back to the value chain. And I think you're, you're totally right. We need that facilitation and that platform to get to the next level. Um, so one more question I have to you guys is, um, what technologies do you believe will have the biggest impact on the urban environment? I can start with a go. Um, I thought I should bring a concrete example from the, the urban tech uh, startups and, and a pilot that we have been working on. Um, and that is a German, Hamburg-based uh, startup called Breeze uh, that work actually with um, air quality in cities, which is a huge topic and theme. Um, but when you dive down into it, you cannot believe how crude the data is. Uh, I think there are four data points in Copenhagen and they are all placed in one meter's height. And that is how we inform ourselves about the air pollution, which is, I mean, it's a big topic and you, you have to be aware of how, uh, uh, how bad it is when you buy a house or where you are, where you bicycle and when you do it. But it's very, very crude data and actually so crude that you cannot inform yourself sufficiently. So we thought, how, why don't we try and connect with uh, air inside buildings and outside buildings? It was a collaboration between Velux and Covi and started exploring that. And it was a bit strange to all three of us because we were out of our comfort zones. But it turned out really well uh, because we established a pilot in uh, Humleby, which is Carlsberg, just here down the road. Uh, some old workers' uh, homes that was made more than 100 years ago, today very attractive. Uh, and we established um, the censoring of the connection between outdoor air pollution and indoor air and see can we somehow make uh, the climate envelope uh, windows open accordingly. And that just informed on a very small scale, two pilots, they're still running. Um, what is the air pollution in this height, which you don't have any information about? And also the fact that if you do pancakes without properly uh, getting rid of the particles, 
that is like five times as bad as Hans Christian Andersen's Boulevard in the uh, peak uh, time. So maybe be more careful about what you do after you fry pancakes <laughs> than, uh, than be worried about where you bicycle uh, at, the, at the peak time. So it's just getting this, um, you know... Relative. Uh, uh, grinding it down. Yeah. And, and getting a feel for it, and it was informative for all the three parties, and I think we're going we're gonna to build on it, uh, bec because it was actually very successful. And, and you cannot talk outdoor air pollution without talking indoor air pollution. You cannot talk cities without talking buildings. And cities have to be livable, but buildings have to be lovable. So it, there is a so combination. Air quality, definitely a topic. Natasha, Michael? Let me add a, another practical example, and I need to be careful here because if you're uh, running urban tech, then you need to look after all your startups, uh, uh, like your children, and treat them equally. But I have to today single out just one as a practical you, you example. You get a harder question afterwards, so thank I'm you. Looking forward so, to uh, so let's look at the case of, of Infotiles, a Norwegian startup uh, recently raised another uh, 1.5 million euros. A very exciting stage of growth. And what they do is basically go in and help city governments uh, make sense of all the various data streams that they have. They could even plug Breeze into this and add it in to basically strategic decision making, right? If we think about the assets that cities uh, own, right? So some of you might have been to a city like Sao Paulo, 20 million plus people. Um, the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies uh, has a recent report out, I commend it to you, around regenerative cities. And in that, they project there will be uh, cities with, with 50 million plus, uh, if not even 100 million, basically living in these mega structures and so on. So there's really a lot of stake in city government. And if we can help them using uh, basically the, the cleverness and the speed and agility of startups to basically help inform these very old structures. And then somewhat kicking and screaming in the nicest possible way, drag some of these large existing corporates with them that have the skills and capability to, to help uh, support and service the changes that are needed. Then I think we have a, a fighting chance. But that's only one example. Um, I could keep going for much longer. All right. Like. All right. Thanks, Natasha. Well, I wouldn't say one technology because technology plays together. That's why even though I, I am a geek and I love technology, it's not blockchain alone, data alone, AI alone, quantum technology alone. They play together. Yeah. So we cannot say one technology. But what we need in order to create the change is that we look at are we solving the symptom or the cause? Is this dress made out of reused plastic bottles from the ocean? Then I'm not fixing the problem. I should stop throwing it into the ocean at the first place. It's not, by the way. So when we invest, are we solving for the small part that is the symptom, or are we looking at the bigger impact? And the second, how big is the impact? Because if you can solve a big problem in the world for many people, you're going to find the profit anyway. But it's just a nice, fancy idea that's going to be wonderful to point out in a creativity competition. We're not going to reach so, the 230 goal. So what's the impact for you? in the urban environment? Well, it is that we, we uh, make solutions that, that uh, reaches a lot of people. So I mentioned traffic. Mm -hmm. Well, that technology does not stand in the way for us figuring out where can we find an available parking, parking lot. Why don't we solve for that? That's 30% of all traffic in the city, so it's easy. So finding those low-hanging fruits, that big problems that can be solved easily with technology, and then we can show, and I think this is an evolution, we need to show decision makers governments, organizations that courage into thinking differently can actually have a huge impact and be profitable as well. So technology is for billions of people. Yes. Michael. Can I, um, you talking about the low hanging fruit, I think I uh, completely agree with that. If I can just add a little nuance in that the, the intractable problem ends, right? Sometimes organizations come across up against a wall which they have to either climb, go through, or do something about, right? So you probably have heard that uh, sorry, uh, Shell uh, has some you know, legal entanglements. Uh, it's only in the Netherlands, but it's beginning to set a precedent for a different type of, of intervention into how they operate their, their organization. Uh, I expect that we'll see regulations start playing a, a bigger role. Um, and then the, the other thing uh, is basically activist investors, right? So uh, is it one or two seats on the Exxon board are now basically held by activist investors. So there's basically a lot of different things in, happening in a lot of different uh, spaces that are worth keeping an eye on. That doesn't take away the need for really smart startups to be able to work with very large existing organizations so that uh, we can accelerate the change, though. All right, thanks. So uh, here comes the tough question. We got five minutes uh, left, and um, 
I know that Velux are providing a lot of great solutions uh, to many people today. So I'll wait with you, Lona, and then start over here. But um, and, and to you, Michael, you are focused on the very early stage. So we go a little bit later, like uh, if a company actually have a product which is de-risk, but needs to really get out there. So one company that really needs to get out there and could be a potential Danish one where we could build like a, the discussion has been about, you know, large companies, hopefully a gigacorn or a unicorn status. Um, which company would you invest, say, 10, 15 million euros in right now if you had to choose, or which area would you invest into if you can't come up with a specific company? I'll let one of the two of you start and then let Lona... Can we ask a clarifying question? What is your time horizon, question? 15 years. 15 years. Easy then. Quantum technology as an area. We, don't, we have uh, around 20 companies in Denmark uh, developing uh, enabling technologies for quantum technology. And it's not about the supercomputer. There's other stuff that's on the shorter term, but definitely quantum technologies. And how would that impact the urban environment? Well, you, we have Moore's law. You all know that. We're gonna, that's, is, that is reaching an end. So by the end of that, you need a new law. And that's where quantum mechanics comes in and quantum technology. So we can calculate stuff with the data we have and with machine learning and artificial intelligence in measures we can't imagine today. So I'm passionate about that. Okay, <laughs> I can hear that. Michael? Okay, well, in that case, I'm going to adapt my answer a little bit and, and just to, to um, uh, put it differently, uh, at the edge of urban tech, there's probably something called reg tech, which is regulatory technology, right? Um, uh, recently, um, uh, was it Bill Gates actually who came out and said that uh, by you know, the, the president of Microsoft, the different chap, Mr. Smith, came out and said by 2024 already, basically the world might be over because of uh, machine learning, or as it's known in PowerPoint, artificial intelligence. Um, and so I think there's scope for a startup to come in and look at uh, basically how to help regulate machine learning and ultimately AI which becomes enabled by uh, quantum. Because I think this is an inevitability, and then this is an inevitable follow-on uh, need. So here we are really talking deep tech technologies and yeah. areas where you are believing that those will impact the urban environment in a positive way. Yeah. But you're kind of both saying we should invest into it, but we should also find a way to control it. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Absolutely, yeah. we did that with cars as well. Yeah. <laughs> Lorna? Well, for the sake of the argument, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a, uh, another standpoint, and I think it would be the human learning. I, the human I would, what? The human learning rather than the machine learning. Um, during COVID-19, we have been not locked up, but there's been a lockdown, and people have, been, uh, have had to stay in their homes. So we have put our homes to a pressure cooker test and found out mm, something needs to change. I need to change the home, or I personally changed the shower head. That was time. 12, uh, 12 years, and now we're changing that shower head. But apart from that, we were actually quite happy, and I found an extra square meter where I could sit and work perfectly. And I hadn't found that in the previous 12 years. So that was great for an architect to establish that. Um, but on a larger scale, I think that we uh, know very little about our homes and the relationship with our homes. And I think we could um, Fitbit our homes put the 15 million euros into uh, benchmarks so that we change the normative benchmark for what it is homes do. Because we, are, we see homes as such a big commodity, either investment or relating to it, that we have to know oh, what is the mainstream benchmark, how is this good, uh, postal code, uh, size, all of that. So work with that and do it in a more qualified way. If you Fitbit it so that you know what is good for you, indoor climate, uh, 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 quality aspects, quality of experience, then you would be able to change on such a huge scale with having that investment what people would go and ask for. So you would, in, in effect, change the market demand. And that's what we need, because if the market asks for it, the building and construction industry is going to deliver it. 60 seconds. You get one word. So if you were to basically dedicate yourself to doing one extra thing uh, and that would Im do a good impact in 2021, what would uh, that in one word be, how would that be described? Uh, Michael, start with you. Well, so for me, it's, it's obvious it's on track, right? So next week we are selecting from 20 startups uh, we, down to 10. We're going to be putting them through their paces with three corporates where we hope to take on some of these challenges, whether we fit bit at home, 
let's definitely do that. Whether we actually find a gigacorn, and maybe that's really where the billion or million we have should go, right? Because that has an immediate measurable return. But basically, there's a clear track for what we're going to do next. Uh, and I hope you will come in and join and help and support. So the one word is? Is uh, follow the path. Great, thank yeah, you. That's not one word. Yeah. <laughs> Value chain dash innovation is actually two there words, but cheating. Amazing. Thank you, Lone. Rethink the, the ecosystem of buildings. More words, but lots of action behind. Thank you very much, Lone, Natasha, and Michael. Thank you. Thank you.